thigh moma. If you take a PF with the chest, obviously you can say it is anterior mediastinum because of the so called silhouette sign. What is the silhouette sign? Any mass that obscures the cardiac border, particularly the superior or inferior cardiac border, it must be in the anterior mediastinum. And you don't have to take a lateral, it confirms in the anterior mediastinum. But you don't know what the structure of that uh, tumor is. So you take a CT, there is a mass, several areas of necrosis, and this is thymoma. Whereas here, well circumscribed, still in the anterior mediastinum, the uh, lateral view shows. And if you look carefully, there is a characteristic density around the margin. This indicates it is a teratodermoid. But of course, we have to take a CT to find out sometimes calcifications, teeth, bones, etc. Sometimes we can get even sebaceous material as balls, sebaceous balls. Another teratodermoid, look at the calcification in the lateral view, it must be a teratodermoid. Thymomas, do they calcify? Rarely they calcify. This is what is called a thymolipoma, thymic cyst. Occasionally they may calcify, but this is common in teratodermoids calcification. Then we come to lymphoma. In a PAVU, there is a right, big right hilar mass. We know it is nodes, particularly in children, because bronchogenic carcinoma doesn't usually occur in childhood. So we know it is nodes, and then lateral view also shows that it is a nodal mass. But then if you take a, uh, the CT, you know there are nodes along the iota in the anterior mediastinum. Also there are nodes below the superior vena cava along the paratical area. This is lymphoma. And then at this time you may ask what are the indications for chest? If you can diagnose most of the patients by PA, lateral and oblique views, where is the indication for a costly investigation like a CT? Well, again, to come to the structure, what contains in the mediastinal mass, in the matrix, is it calcification, is it sebaceous material, is it lipomatous tissue, is it vascular tissue, you need a CT in the chest. And then often you may miss a peripheral pleural nodules, small metastatic nodules or pleural nodules. And for that, a cross-sectional view of CT is essential. Lung nodules, small less than 3 millimeters, less than 5 millimeters, which you cannot see on a PA view or lateral view because the thoracic cage obscures it, the CT helps. Differentiation of solid and cystic, of course, you can do a sonogram, but uh, the matrix of that solid or cystic structure, you can well see by CT. Fatty are vascular tumors and, of course, cardiovascular system. Again, a big anterior mediastinal mass looks like a, as if the heart is enlarged, but it's still in the anterior mediastinum, as you see in the lateral view, it is a lymphoma, terrible lymphoma. The prognosis is not so good. Another heart chance lymphoma, obscuring all the details of the cardiovascular silhouette, lymph nodal enlargement. Now we come to middle mediastinum. Again, the common Structure in the middle mediastinum is lymph nodes, perihilar nodes, and then bronchogenic cyst, vascular structures, either a pulmonary artery or part of the aorta, esophagus, also is in the middle mediastinum, and herniations, hiatal herniations to the esophageal hiatus. Nodes, right paratracheal nodes in the left film, and then right paratracheal and both hilar nodes. And this proved to be tuberculosis. In our country, in a childhood, you have to think of a tuberculosis first and then only lymphoma and other conditions. Whereas here, if you look at the nodes, they are discrete in the hilum. And in the lateral view, they are surrounding the hilum. This is typical of sarcoidosis. Yes, sarcoidosis is rare, particularly in children, but still, occasionally you may get a 15-year-old, 16-year-old student comes with a little cough and a mild fever and if you look at the PA with the chest, there are nodes, don't immediately jump, this is our tuberculosis or lymphoma. Again, another case of sarcoidosis, typical potato-like nodes, both hyla and right paratracheal. 
and what is the differential diagnosis when the mediastinal lymph nodes are enlarged again 90-95 percent of the time it is tuberculosis and then rarely sarcoidosis and lymphoma also you have to consider there is massive enlargement of the nodes, metastasis, infectious mononucleosis, pseudo lymphoma the patient is on for anti-epileptic drugs, Gardena or some other drug you get a pseudo lymphoma. Castleman's disease rare but you can get lymph nodal enlargement and angioimmunolymphadenopathy is quite rare but uh, only a biopsy can prove that is a angioimmunolymphadenopathy. Duplication cysts in the middle middle of the they are common and uh, here in this particular case it is in the left uh, era aortic area and in the lateral view it is extending posterior. How can we uh, tell it is a duplication cyst? Only ultrasound or CT. CT, sure, it is a duplication cyst, a big one in the left paraiotic area. Sometimes a cystic hygroma can extend into the mediastinum too. Of course, most of the time it is anterior. Occasionally it may extend into the middle mediastinum. Now we come to the vascular rings. Often, particularly the common uh, entity, there are three types of anomalous aorta and vascular rings, but the most important one is the right sided aorta. Normally, the trachea is deviated to the right because of the normal aortic knob is on the left side. But in this case, on a PAV of the chest, there is a slight deviation of the trachea to the left and there is an absence of aortic knob, you think of a right sided aorta. And if you look at the barium swallow, there is indentation, instead of being on the left side, it is on the right side and posterior indentation also because it is going posterior to the esophagus. And I don't want to discuss about the various types of vascular uh, rings and slings because that again forms a different lecture. Now we come to the posterior mediastinum. The most common posterior mediastinum mass is a neurogenic tumor. Could be a neurofibroma, could be a, say neuroblastoma, ganglion neuroma, but neurogenic tumor. Occasionally you can see a lateral thoracic meningocele also reflecting the posterior mediastinum. And then of course, hiatal hernias, although we said in the middle mediastinum it is common, but in children, wherever there is an absence, a partial or complete absence of the diaphragm, or there is an opening in the pleuroperitoneal canal, the so-called Wachdelac hernia, it occurs in the postolateral area. And then ectopic kidney, occasionally it may not descend into the abdomen and you may find a posterior mediastinal mass. An IVP really tells whether the kidney or not. Lymphoma, although we said earlier the lymph nodes are more common in the middle and anterior mediastinum, rarely they may extend into the posterior mediastinum region also. And then, for example, look at the Coolis anemia or extramedullary hemopoiesis. It may occur in the posterior mediastinum, the paravertebral area or prevertebral area. And then, cardioma, rare in children. Meningocele in a neurofibromatosis or is isolated a lateral meningocele reflecting in the posterior mediastinum one may see. And then fucomocytoma, neurogenic tumor and aneurysms rare in children. Again neuroblastoma. See earlier I showed you a similar mass but it is in the anterior mediastinum and calcification. Here it is in the posterior mediastinum and calcification a neuroblastoma. Again, another curvilinear calcification in the posterior mediastinum, neuroblastoma, deviating the esophagus to the right side. Six-year-old boy with pain in the chest and cough for four months and as usual they have treated for TB. Why TB? Occasionally you can get a perifocal exudate. There may be a primary focus, perifocal exudate may show as a consolidation and right paratracheal nodes may be obscured. So they treated it for TB, but then there is no response. Ultrasound showed reflections because there are calcifications in the mass. Although a PFU you don't chest any calcification, but by ultrasound it is so sensitive it showed some calcifications. Again CT to confirm this, although it is a posterior mediastinum, there is no space posteriorly. So it extends to the middle and anterior mediastinum also. 
realize that fallacy. We always describe posterior mediastinal masses should restrict to the posterior mediastinal segment. They are neurogenic, but occasionally if they are so large because the vertebra is behind, the tumor extends to the middle and anterior mediastinum. This is one of those examples. Well, again to go through the various neurogenic masses, neuroblastoma, which is malignant, ganglion neuroma, neurofibroma or schwannoma, neuroentric cyst and meningocytes. All in all, a chest radiograph is essential for management of diseases. Doesn't matter whatever disease it is, please advise to take a film of the chest. And once that is, the chest findings are ruled out, then you can proceed further. Now we come to the main, because when we say radiology of the chest, everybody focuses on lungs and pleura. We will come to the main disorders of the lungs. What are they? How do you categorize? Either congenital or developmental, acquired, traumatic, inflammatory, infectious and infarctions. We are not talking about the metabolic and collagen vascular disorders in this topic. Developmental and abnormalities of lung and children, agenesis, partial agenesis, of course complete agenesis, the infant won't survive, hypoplasia of one segment or entire lobe or entire lung, anomalous branching of the bronchi, bronchial atresia, cysts of foregut, sequestration, AV malformation and venolobar syndromes. Agenesis of the right bronchus. Look at the heart, entire mediastinum is shifted to the right, compensatory emphysema and herniation of the left lung to the right. Agenesis again, right lung, agenesis, look at the angiogram. Look at the pulmonary artery branches. Unilateral pulmonary hypoplasia could be simple hypoplasia, not agenesis. Absence of pulmonary artery so that the intercostal arteries, the bronchial arteries supply the lung. Anomalous venous return, so called scimitar syndrome, accessory diaphragm, and pulmonary sequestration. All these comprise unilateral pulmonary hypoplasia. Again, one on the left side is right lung. Agenesis completely. There is no aeration of the lung except that the left lung has herniated. Right dome of the diaphragm is elevated and the, there is a collapse, almost a contraction of the ribs. And on the left lung, there is partial agenesis. Look at the esophagus stretching to the left side. And then in the bronchogram, you see the left bronchus is atretic. Partial agencies. Not completely atretic, partially atretic. Again, partial agencies of the left lung, left lower lobe can be seen, aerated well. Partial agencies of the right upper lobe looks like a collapse, but then there is no vascular supply from the pulmonary artery. The angiogram helps that way. Lobar emphysema, postnatal over distension generally. They manifest in the postnatal period in infancy. One or more lobes. Of course, surgical treatment is the only choice. Differential diagnosis, tension pneumothorax. Look at the chest PA view. The left uh, hemithorax is completely loosened. Immediately you may think of a hemothorax or obstructive emphysema or compensatory emphysema for the right uh, lung partial agencies or bronchiectasis. Cephalococcal pneumonia, when it dissolves, produces a large nematocele which ultimately resolves but occasionally it may persist and unilateral translucency due to various causes from soft tissue absence, absence of pectoralis muscles to mcleod swire James syndrome. Again infections are common either viral, bacterial, amongst bacterial we are mostly concerned with cox, mycoplasma, pneumocystis carinae and fungal pneumonias. And to establish uh, th certain patterns, we have to know before establishing the diagnosis. What are they? Uh, you can categorize them into infiltrates. You see, any lesion, abnormal opacity in the lung, first we call it infiltrate. Infiltrate does not mean tuberculosis. Lots of clinicians, when they report infiltrate in the right mid zone, they think it is tuberculosis in the needle. No. 
could be viral, mycoplasmal, fungal, anything. Infiltrate is an abnormal shadow produced by lymphocytes, infections, etc. And if you categorize them into alveolar and interstitial, it will be much easier to have a diagnosis. For example, somebody reports that it infiltrate purely alveolar, you think of a pneumonic consolidation. But it's interstitial, interstitial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, etc. Sometimes they are mixed alveolar and interstitial. Sometimes they are miliary, like miliary tuberculosis. But all miliary densities are not only miliary tuberculosis. A tropical agent aphelia may produce occasionally acute aspergillosis, may produce a miliary form. And sometimes nodular densities also you see in infections. Say for example, a 16 year old, well developed girl, as you see, comes with a density in the left upper lobe. What could this be? There are several things, but if it is an infiltrate, think of tuberculosis. As I said earlier in my talk, some of the, in a PV chest, you may obscure some of the infiltrates. This particular girl comes with temperature and they decide it is of unknown origin. And again, the clinical examination by stethoscope is limited. Sometimes there is a lesion that may not be any crackles or rails or ronchi. But sometimes, if you persist, there may be some indication. This clinician is an astute clinician and he said, take another chest. And we took a large dotic view, lo and behold, there is a small protest which was obscured in the PAV chest. So, it is important to use certain techniques in order to bring out the infiltrate obscuring. Of course, today, everybody jumps to a CT because that really cross-sectional CT really reveals any obscured lesion in a PAV chest. In this particular case, lateral view of the chest may not help. Again, primary complex, tuberculous nodes with a perifocal exudate, a pneumonic type of patch in a primary complex in a child. Viral pneumonias, for example, this 14 year old girl comes with a restless breathing, respiratory distress, and then why? She developed pulmonary edema due to the influence of virus. Look at the bilateral symmetrical opacities with the air bronchogram. Now consolidation. Consolidation, particularly in pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias, it may be located in only one lobe. Look at this, right upper lobe, limited by the transverse fissure. Consolidation, localized patchy consolidation, bacterial pneumonia. Whereas here, that pneumonia, not the same case, but another pneumonia, at the time the patient had uh, several uh, symptoms, clinical symptoms, and then by this time it has cavitated. Look at that meniscus type of sign, lung abscess. And this particular type of pneumonia is generally due to staphylococcal. Bacterial pneumonia, for example, pneumococcal pneumonia does not uh, come with a picture like this, staphylococcal, pseudomonas, pneumonia can come and present with a, an abscess like this. And of course, when the necrotic material is all, you may get a pneumatoceal, which eventually disappears. Multiple patches like that, lung abscesses, some focus, a tonsillar abscess or some abscess might be there, it throws emboli, pulmonary emboli, septic emboli, and produces this multiple. This should not be mistaken for cannonball type metastasis because in adults if you get this, you think of metastasis first. At this, the patient with their cephalococcal pneumonia developed a pneumothorax with a small effusion. This is one of those cases they put in a needle, that's why there is subcutaneous emphysema. This is a result of treatment of cephalococcal pneumonia. Plural effusion is more common in cephalococcal pneumonia rather than bacterial pneumococcal pneumonia. Typical lung abscess in a PAVU, you don't know in which segment. Is it in the anterior segment of the 
అప్పర్ లో లేటర్ సెగ్మెంట్ అది మిడిల్ లో ఆర్ యాజ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ది సుపీరియర్ సెగ్మెంట్ అది లోయర్ లో క్లాసికల్ విత్ థిక్ వాల్ యు కాంట్ థింక్ ఆఫ్ ఎ టెంపర్ క్లోజ్ హియర్ బికాస్ థిక్ వాల్ విత్ ఎన్ ఎయిర్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ లెవెల్ అండ్ విత్ ఓన్లీ వన్ యాబ్సెస్ విత్ అవుట్ ఎనీ ఇన్ఫిల్ట్రేట్ ఇన్ ఎనీ అదర్ ప్లేస్ వన్ ఆన్ ద రైట్ సైడ్ దెర్ ఈస్ ఎమ్ యాస్ is a pneumonia but there are several calcifications this proved to be a hematoma could be tuberculoma well possible but this popcorn type of calcifications classical of a hematoma hematoma is nothing but a, a massive consolidation of all the components of that particular organ for example a hematoma of the lung what does it contain bronchial cartilage cartilage alveolar tissue and some debris and some vessels also one on the right side it is a rabbit eye type of appearance and then if you look carefully there is emphysema in the left upper lobe this nodular density with peripheral emphysema you think of a bronchial atresia because of the atritic bronchus the mucus accumulates and this how it shows in for example if a pulmonary hypersensitive pulmonary aspergillosis you also get bronchiectasis central bronchiectasis with cloud like finger because of the mucus content but this is localized and peripheral emphysema classical of bronchial atresia leukemia i showed you earlier about the skeleton thoracic cage infiltrates and periosteal reactions here interstitial type of infiltrates all over could be interstitial pneumonia possible but uh, in the light of uh, known diagnosis of leukemia these are leukemic infiltrates occasionally superimposed opportunistic infections also may enter into the lungs and you should not mistake that all due to leukemic infiltrates again a little older 16 years boy actually a student comes with chronic cough and again you see earlier we used to say in children in a primary complex you just hyalur nodes and perifocal exudate this is more or less an adolescent type of primary complex just to show on ct air bronchogram and bronchopneumonia and the differentiation this is liver on your right side is portal venous gas due to some uh, a lesion and necrosis in the bowel gas enters into the portal veins and it should not be mistaken one for each other ct although it is a high technology still it poses some problems in the differential diagnosis if you don't know the fundamentals foreign bodies of course this is in the esophagus because it is seen on the face of it whereas if you see enfos border then you could think of in that bronchial that is in the trachea that foreign body non radiopaque foreign bodies peanuts or betel nuts people are fond of the children are fond of that and that produces obstructive emphysema look at on the right side hyperventilation of the lung wide spread spaces in intercostal places slight depression of the right lung as compared with the left this is obstructive emphysema again there is atelectasis in the right upper lobe because of the foreign body in the right upper lobe bronchus compensatory emphysema again another after removal of that foreign body you see still some emphysema on the left side maybe there is a, a small foreign body in the left bronchus too that's why bronchoscopy is necessary and find out explore both bronchi because often we said the foreign body is in the right bronchus and at bronchoscopy they found on the left bronchus maybe it, out of cough it jumped into the left bronchus or another foreign body may be there in the left bronchus classical of middle lobe atelectasis in the pa view the pneumonia but that pneumonia is celebrating with the right cardiovascular celebrity is slightly shifted to the right and you see in the lateral view consolidation plus atelectasis why atelectasis the transverse pressure is pushed down right middle lobe atelectasis with pneumonia and in the left upper lobe and this particular case it is a 17 year old boy comes with chronic cough and it is his bronchial adenoma in the left upper lobe bronchus 
atelic disease, what we call a C or the trained eye. And when they look at the PA with the chest, they say pleural effusion because of the opacity. But if you look carefully, pleural effusion tracks along the lateral thoracic cage with a concavity looking at the mediastin. Whereas here, it's a triangular opacity in the right cardiophrenic angle, silhouetting both the right domo diaphragm and right cardiac border. That means the obstruction is in the intermediate bronchus that produces atelectasis. And then we come to pleural effusions. Pleural effusions are not uncommon. They are massive or small pleural effusions in children. And occasionally you may get a thickening also because of the treatment for tuberculosis or empyema. And then at that time you have to know whether it is thickening or pleural effusion. Take a decubitus lateral view if you believe in radiology or you take a ultrasonogram to detect whether it is pleural thickening or free pleural effusion. One on your left side is massive pleural effusion. One on your right side is to detect the layering in the decubitus lateral views. The right pleural effusion, decubitus lateral view, you can see the layering of the pleural fluid. And if you, of course, you can take a lateral view and posteriorly you can see the blunting of the posterior costophrenic angle and silhouetting in the dome of the diaphragm, but you may think it may be pneumonia. So, decubitus lateral view or ultrasonography is essential to say it is definitely pleural effusion. And sometimes hydronemothorax or pyonemothorax are loculated with an air fluid level on the left side. Simple diagnosis. And that should not be mistaken for a eventration or herniation through the dome of the diaphragm. Eventration of the diaphragm, triad, left dome of the diaphragm is elevated, heart is shifted, air bubble of the stomach is high, classical of a eventration. But occasionally, in the differential diagnosis, a strangulated stomach through a traumatic diaphragmatic hernia, you may see that. Again, another classical example of eventation of the dome of the diaphragm. Look at the thin part of the diaphragm and look at the stomach bubble, the superior part of the stomach, almost silhouetting and looking like a diaphragm. In children, of course, these are infants, but sometimes the symptoms may escape during infancy and they may come in the adolescent stage or even adult uh, stage with these massive pleuroperitoneal diaphragmatic or so-called walk de lac hernias. They are common on the left side and should not be mistaken for cystic adenomatoid disease of the lung because you see the continuation of the intestines from the abdomen to the chest. Typical examples, if you are still skeptic, you can introduce a little barium, thin barium or even a contrast material to show that the intestines are in the hemithorax. It is rare on the right side, but one on your extreme right side, chest shows on the right side also you can get a herniation through the foramen of bucket line. Through the regular esophageal hiatal hernia, herniated stomach, and the left hemothorax, the air fluid level. And again, in order to differentiate from an abscess, of course, clinically you know that the child does not have any symptoms, but instill a little barium or a contrast medium, you know that stomach and fluid level. Through the foramen of morgagni, these are less common in children, but occasionally you can come across, and then one on the left side. Look at the short esophagus and the lateral border of the stomach, the air fluid level. On the right side, classical example, should not be mistaken for an abscess. Another example, two examples, frankly, hiatal hernia. And one on the right side, the, even the duodenum herniates through, but often it is the stomach that herniates through the foramen of morgagni. This is the sternocostal or hiatus. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have more or less finished various manifestations of the chest by imaging methods, mainly by the conventional radiology and mainly involving the thoracic cage because often it is neglected by non-radiologists. That's why more emphasis is laid on thoracic cage 
and then of course mediastinum, lungs, pleura and diaphragm.